Kim Elgia is I am the director of Oxy Arts. Oxy Arts is an interdisciplinary hub for the arts on campus and the community for Oxydale College. Uh, we program works that are relevant to the community, to our students, and we're really excited to present this panel tonight. Before I get into the panel, I want to just give you one thing coming up, our, our next programming item that you may want to come join us for is a film screening horrible period in uh, LA history in the 60s and 70s where um, women, uh, Latinx women were um, without their knowledge uh, sterilized in hospitals, in LA County hospitals when they were going in to um, have children and have babies. And uh, This film is a documentation of that period. We'll have the producer and one of the, um, one of the women that was painted with the case against the county with us that night. So this panel, I'm so excited for these incredible artists. So just a little bit of history about this, how this all happened. Um, just a nod to our friend Keith Wallace. So Keith Wallace and Oxy Arts, we started a conversation about a year ago now, a long time ago. We just like back and forth, chilling. What do we do? Can we do something? Can we, can we what, what can we do? So the bitter game, which you'll hear about, is, uh, is a uh, production that Keith Wallace wanted. And we thought about how it could be, how could we maybe post it or produce it. It ultimately turned out that we couldn't, and it's kind of beyond our budget. But we wanted to still do something with Keith, and we thought, what else could we do? How could we kind of capture this incredible energy and generate a discussion that's beyond just you know a performance artist and Keith as an actor, but thinking about all the arts and art, artists from different disciplines and. What, what, what else can we talk about? How can we generate further discussion and empower all of you and, and ways that we can and also invite community activist groups to be part of this conversation? So this is how this panel came about. We invited these additional artists who are incredible, not only artists, but change agents in their respective fields and um, really excited for the conversation. And I want to introduce our moderator, Kaylee Stovall. Know everybody a little bit better and what they do. So, Deidre, we 
would you do us the honors of? No, everybody. <laughs>
Um, but yeah, I, I realized that um, my voice is, is felt and Crump allows me to say everything that I want to say um, without words. I'm going to use it. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Keith Wallace. I am an actor, writer, director. My background is primarily in theater. I've been doing it for quite some time. And um, I got my MFA in acting from UC San Diego. Um, graduated in 2016, but it was a few years prior to that when I first began working. Well, it was there that I kind of learned that I could leverage my artistic expression with my um, interest in social justice and advocacy. Um, before, for whatever reason, those two ideas seemed kind of mutually exclusive in my mind. I wasn't ever taught or shown in a direct way. I, I was always involved in community work, involved in advocacy, social justice. And I was an artist, I was able to connect the two dots. And, uh, and it was being in school in San Diego, um, kind of right, uh, right when the Black Lives Matter movement started to gain national attention, right? So um, in 2014, in the summer of 2014, when Michael Brown was murdered, of course it wasn't the first instance of police murder, um, and, and unfortunately as we've seen, it wasn't the last, but for whatever reason, um, I feel like Mike Brown's murder kind of struck me to my core in a different way. Now, a little bit of context, I was in grad school at the time in San Diego, uh, more specifically La Jolla, California, which is like a very affluent, um, white, conservative suburb of San Diego. Um, and there was a little bit of cognitive dissonance that I was experiencing occupying that kind of space when people who looked like me um, and very well could be me were being uh, murdered um, with impunity by police and then there were other people um, mobilizing around the country putting their bodies and voices on the front line to advocate for this issue and I'm in grad school you know doing Shakespeare and rolling around on the floor breathing and pretending to be a clam or whatever you do <laughs> in, in school and I was like this, this I just couldn't couldn't reconcile the two and I, and I, and I actually was in a really uh, kind of deep state of emotional turmoil and unrest and, and kind of depression, you know what I mean, if I really want to be honest about it. So what I decided to do on my um, summer break, I didn't have a whole lot of money or political influence or sway or anything like that, no, no following you know, on social media or anything like that. But I knew that I had my passion um, and my righteous indignation about what was happening and I had my artistic sensibility. So I decided to, um, I'm originally from Philadelphia, uh, so I went home to kind of visit my family just for like a week because I was headed to open and work on another show. But while I was there, I decided to stage this um, silent protest um, performance art uh, installation um, where I recreated or restaged rather Michael Brown's um, murder scene using my body as, um, as Michael's in the installation. And I decided to do this in downtown Philadelphia, Center City, Philadelphia with the, um, right beneath that iconic love statue with the Tilted Elm, I'm sure everybody's seen it, right? It's a very heavily trafficked, touristy area. You know, people come to get their pictures with the, the statue in, in the Rocky sets, like, you know, kind of down the Franklin Parkway in the distance. So I just rolled up there one afternoon, um, put police tape around, and uh, set up this, this, um, this performance art piece. And uh, I had a couple of friends with me. Um, I had written up, before I got there, um, an artistic statement um, on one side of the pa a paper about who I was and what I was trying to do, and then the other side, some action items and then also some information from the ACLU about what to do if you're stopped by police or if you feel uh, as though you um, have been, uh, yeah, excessive force has been used against you by law enforcement. Um, so I took you know, a couple of friends with me, and we handed out, they handed out these papers while I lay on the ground for an hour. Um, in the same way that Michael's body was laying on the ground exposed in a community where he grew up um, in the sun uncovered on full display for four hours, you know, kind of like a public display of white supremacy in a way that lynchings um, were back during the um, uh, Jim Crow era. And so, um, and so it was interesting because, like I said, like, a, a one part of activism, I'm sorry if I'm jumping out over here, but is being on the front lines and the other still like questions. Sorry. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got more. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But um, then there's another form that's, that, that takes a different approach, and this would be this quieter, more um, distilled approach, you know, just kind of something I felt compelled to do and didn't know what would come of it. Anyway, long story short, the first couple of minutes, people kind of back away, didn't know what was going on, kind of come. Fast forward, people said, minutes later, people started to step over me, stand beside me, get their picture, crop me out. It, it turned into this really crazy thing. When they showed up, they didn't do anything, they just kind of watched and let me do my thing. Um, but the photos ended up going on social media and it went viral. So from that experience, I gained this kind of attention about this thing that was important to me and, uh, and used that as leverage to kind of uh, in, create, to begin working on what ended up becoming The Bitter Game, which is a solo, as Malia said before, a solo performance where uh, I'm the writer for you um, and, uh, and I've been traveling and touring around the country and internationally with this show for like the last three years. Um, but it's a show about police violence and really more specifically about a relationship between a mother and a son and how she tries to protect him against this impending violence that she sees happening so much to other um, people in the world who look like him and, and how we, um, and how implicit bias uh, plays into what often becomes uh, fatal or deadly interactions with law enforcement. So we can play a little, little clip of the show. If you have a girl problems at the bathroom, son, I got no no problems at the chamber. Can't be in this night before when my trunk is full. In my bed, if you remember, it's the motherfucking hour. Like two jokes, you drop. Oh, oh, Did he, did he just say that 
homes matter like books and black lives? Because that's not a light statement. And knowing the kind of rich, rich legacy that Prince leaves behind, I really want to get into, and in fact, he gave me permission to sink deeper into my sonic practice. Um, I coined a term called DJ Scholarship in 2013 um, that is a liberatory sort of sonic um, methodology that allows me to delve deeply into the lives of black artists um, and into the music industry, which I associate with being one of the institutions of a sort of white supremacist order. Um, and I say that because of the long-standing history of the music industry and its direct um, kind of connection between the um, emancipation of enslaved black people and the sort of rise of the prison industry and also the rise of the, of the music industrial complex. And so part of my work includes looking deeply at music using four cultural practices. The first is chasing samples. And I talk about chasing samples because in the 1980s, part of my surviving the sort of crack rage era was turning to my radio. So one of the things that I did for hours and hours was wrote down lyrics to all of my favorite songs. By the end of the year, I had like 100 songs that I had memorized. And then I started to kind of think critically about the music. And then I got confused because I'd be playing my music. And then I'd hear a song by James Brown coming out of my dad's room. I'm like, Dad, you want to play Public Enemy? He's like, no, that's James Brown. I'm like, no, no, that's Public Enemy, right? So learning that sampling was this very interesting citational practice and that sampling and hip-hop as a whole was this sort of repository for, for not only this kind of um, combination of different musical genres, but also usable ideas. And so through sampling, I learned about Led Zeppelin and Bach and Bjork and all these other folks, right? And so that was actually a very important thing to me because it taught me about the next cultural practice, which is digging through the crates, which is a sort of metaphor for finding like rare items, musical items in particular. And that digging through the, through the crates is sort of like a very rigorous investigative process that allows me to make these like larger connections to music. And then the third cultural practice is studying album cover art. And through studying album cover art, I've been able to develop, first of all, just the history of album covers um, in black music provides a, a kind of rich way for us to understand the visual representation of black music. But also for me, it introduced me to a way to understand later on in life, artists like Kara Walker and Wicked Chimudu and um, Carrie James Marshall. And so bring other ideas, other artists into my, into my world to understand music and finally, the final practice is reading liner notes. Are you all familiar with liner notes? So liner notes were sort of like a part of the album's um, literature. It was the part of the um, record that let you know who was involved with creating the album, maybe the social and cultural context. And one thing that my work does is looks at Mary Baraka's um, very intentional practice of kind of encouraging black people to write about what black music is because so many musicians, jazz in particular, were like um, sort of losing status when they were reviewing, when they were being reviewed by white males who didn't really understand the context of the music. And that poor understanding could absolutely impact the livelihood of those musicians. But more importantly, Mary Baraka knew that writing our own stories and creating those narratives was a form of power. And so I took that on, and part of what I do in my DJ practice is creating mixtapes and then having themes. The themes could be anything like gospel music and its relationship to sort of funk and soul music, and maybe every one of the songs is referencing either God or some kind of addiction. Um, so you may on an album hear, you know, Aretha Franklin singing Amazing Grace and then Marvin Gaye talking about Mercy Mercy, and in that I'm able to write about the relationship between God and addiction in the black church. Um, and so we can just go to the final practice. And I think this is what's interesting to me is that I've created my own methodology to kind of think about music critically outside of the academy, very, very intentionally, um, even though I'm affiliated with several of those academies. Um, this work comes out of the kind of practice of sort of organic intellectual. Um, shout out to Antonio Gramsci. But just thinking about DJ Pop's scholarship, when I say collecting and assessing music, because I earned thousands of pieces of music, and so that comes from the kind of digging through the praise practice and sampling and then the scholarly analysis. 
that I feel like developed from my understanding of like album cover arts and liner notes. And then finally, a black feminist epistemology, which I absolutely am a student of Clyde Woods, um, who's a scholar, and also Sarah Haley, who wrote um, extensively about this idea of like sonic sabotage and thinking about black women, black blues women in particular. But using that as a theoretical framework to understand black music as a form of social expo explanation. And then also regional and interdisciplinary scholarships. So like part of my work included traveling to South Africa and studying um, electronic music in South Africa in a post-apartheid context and kind of building community with those DJs and having conversations about black US suffering and also black excellence in the US and then kind of having these comparative notes and sharing music and exchanges that happen there. Also traveling to the south of France to understand why Nina Simone and James Baldwin spent so much time there, spent the rest of their lives there, actually died there, and kind of trying to understand what they witnessed for the black folks who lived um, in, in France and sort of how they were engaged. And then also the narrative shifts and the sort of revisioning comes from this kind of idea or this practice that I, I feel like I um, kind of took notes from Alice Walker, who went and found the work of and the grave of, the unmarked grave of Zora Hurston, and sort of using that as a symbolic practice. What does it mean to excavate and unearth these voices of queer folks, trans folks, black folks, black women, um, and other folks that are sort of on the margins of popular music, and retelling their stories, representing their stories through either a mix or through either like sort of just deeper conversations about their significance. And so I'll end by saying like part of this is like, you know, when I, I bring up Prince and I think part of his legacy requires us to think about addiction. You know, I'm thinking about Michael Jackson. Part of his legacy requires us to think about cycles of abuse. And thinking about Aretha Franklin, part of her legacy requires us to think about secrets in the black church that challenge people's faith and their right and their understanding of God because of these secrets that they're holding that are absolutely directly related to plantation politics, sexual violence that lives in our DNA. And so, so much of this information is available through black music.
as artists. So jump in
of my own self-doubt, of my own, you know, uh, insecurities, but show people that by me liberating myself, you can liberate yourself, you know? And uh, I do that through Crump because Crump is, uh, we have basics in Crump, but at the same time, it's a language. So it's a language that I'm able to share with you. Um, and a lot of trauma I dance out the traumas within my body, you know? And so um, it's important that people understand that, you know, everything's not great all the time, you know? And so for me, um, Crump allows me to really express those emotions that I bottle up. Or I feel like everybody has a jar, right? So everybody is always putting stuff in their personal jar. Put it in the jar, put it in the jar. But then rarely do you ever really like get to get something out of the jar, right? And if the, the jar is full, then people end up exploding, right? Once they can't take it anymore, it just explode. But Crump allows me to take certain things out at a time. Um, Crump is not an escape for me. It's a release. And a lot of times, um, I think artists kind of get caught up in this false reality and this false escape of whatever they're really going through in their real life. And so for me, um, Crump allows me to really express those emotions and really just get them out on a real level. You know, it's not a performance, it's not I'm showing you, look what I can do to check and job. You know, this is feel my pain. You know, this is feel my suffering. You know, this is feel my joy. So for me, um, I'm constantly uh, reaching out to change the lives, but still reaching in to continue my change. Um, success for me is a continuum. You know, I don't think that there's like a point of success. I think uh, because I'm a real driven person, um, I don't ever think that my work is done, you know. Um, I always am finding, not even finding, but sometimes the universe just sends a voice my way, or it'll be Malcolm X, or it'll be a Sada Shakur, you know. And a lot of times in our generation, um, we don't know our ancestors, you know. And so for me to be able to blend music of the now or with a, a cool beat, um, along as well as like dance it all so you can physically see. Um, I think that it evokes a, a certain type of attention and it summons a different part of people, you know? So for me, um, yeah, there's no, there's no point of success. I think the success uh, moments or moments come with the, uh, the light bulb, like, oh, she actually remixed Venus alone and got off to that, you know? She danced with Mary J. Blige. In that performance, I actually started off with Mary J. Blige. If you look at my life, you see what I see. And then I ended with Nina Simone. So for me, um, it's basically just being real with myself, along with, um, like I think you said, uh, you know, just bringing back those lost voices in time to uh, really have an understanding that um, nobody's perfect and we all go through things, and then we can all go through them, and grow through them as well. Hmm. Any sense of art as actual items coaching? Yeah, art as actual items. Well, actually. just actionable. Oh, actionable. Actionable changes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, use, I'll use my voice. Uh, yeah, I think for me, you know, thinking about art as actionable changes, <laughs> And success kind of are, are sort of on an equal playing field, and sort of you know thinking about it, Keith, and it's crucial we're we're talking about it. And you know, I've I've recently you know had a painting up at the California African American Museum, and that was so beautiful for me because I got to just activate the painting with so many people I've never even seen before. You know, and just being able to break down people's misconceptions of I guess permission to be in an art space. You know, I think especially being in the black community, black and brown community, of people kind of going there because it's a fun event. You know, their other friends are telling them to go there, but then when they get to the pieces, they're kind of like, you know, they freeze up. And so it was a beautiful thing for me to be there because you can see them want to talk about it. And they're like, oh, you know, I don't have an MFA, I don't have this art historian thing. And I'm like, no, like, if you 
want to talk about it, you can. And then once you give them that permission, they're like, oh, I love how you did the eyes. I love this. And then they start calling out all these things, and you start to see them like really glow. And for me, like that's a beautiful thing because that's someone who usually might not come to a space like this. Um, that now, hopefully, that they might keep coming to camp and that they explore and they go see the Charles White Show of Document and things like that. Um, and even shows with people that don't look like them in paintings, I think it's also important to, to sort of, you know, expand the, the narrative and I think understand the context of why Cam is important and like why Charles White is an important artist. Um, it's because of the context in which he made his art. Um, and so also as actionable items, like just, I think furthering on that, being, being the artist and having your friends be a part of that process and expanding that sense of community is, is totally that paramount to, to my practice and I think to, to why I do art, you know. I think to expand that community and sort of create your own little bubble of, of peace and community, I think that's where you start and that's the heart of it and you hope that it reverberates and that people keep wanting to come into that and go into your bubble like, hey, I, I like what those guys are doing on that You know, and I think that's, that's at the heart of um, I think for me being an actual head is creating that sense of community and awareness of, of other people who are on the same wavelength it is a really beautiful thing. Um, I, so I don't identify as an activist because I, I feel like being an artist is political, certainly for a black girl woman is inherently political. And I, and I say that because historically black folks were pushed to the margins of society and so art and creativity was actually a form of resistance and a way to kind of socially critique their situations and that's been an ongoing practice. And so when I think about you know this kind of story around say for example the Harlem Renaissance, when we really think about how many renaissance occurred over various chocolate cities, and by chocolate cities, which is the majority of black cities, the Detroit Renaissance, the Chicago Renaissance, the Baltimore Renaissance, the Los Angeles Renaissance, that black folks have been creating art, and not just in response to trauma, but certainly as a way to navigate. Um, mm -hmm. So I just, so music is inherently political, to me being an artist is inherently political. So in terms of success, um, I feel like I've been collecting information and stories and music and film and literature for the past kind of like 20 years. And one of my, like, really, um, one of the most important things for me is to be in the classroom. And so my students trip out because when I introduce myself, I introduce myself as DJ Lene Denise. Um, and they're like, who is this person? Like, you look our age. And I'm like, no, well, born in 75. <laughs> but, like, um, I do treat my syllabus like a mixtape. So I will make these kind of seemingly kind of unrelated connections, and then by the end of the course, they'll be like talking about Noah's my babies and his connection to Frida Kahlo and her connection to Mexico and her connect and that connection to Los Angeles and the border and Trump policies, right? And like that's an actual conversation that my students can have because we are also listening to the music of Carlos Santana. Um, or and I tell them like there are three things that I tell them that that will be a part of their kind of learning experience by the time they leave my class, the first is that this music is designed to inspire intellectual curiosity, which I feel like is an actual war on intellectual curiosity, particularly with social media culture where you can say whatever your heart desires <laughs> in seven seconds and it can be distributed to the entire world. <laughs> Whoever has access to that. Um, and then the second thing is to engage black music beyond a form of entertainment. And then the third thing is to develop a critical reading practice, and that means reading multiple texts, music as text, dance as text, literature as text, and kind of understanding that there's an alternative history available through black music because we've been telling this story for centuries, and also we've been telling this story for centuries through literature. Um, and so those things are available to students and they understand that music is a, a pathway that is engaging and less alienating, particularly because they are in these black academic institutions that don't teach them about who they are and certainly don't fully acknowledge the range of contribution that folks of color have made to various forms of knowledge.
you need to know that you are a part of the lineage. And nine times out of 10, those folks have not been introduced to you through your educational experience. And so it is your responsibility as an artist to know the artists that come before you and your line of work, your ancestors and your work. Yep. Okay. So think back off of both of them. Um, yes, to know yourself is very important. However, uh, I feel like research allows you to actually know who you truly are. Um, for me, at Crump, uh, my activism or my stand, um, nobody was doing it before, right? Everybody was using it as just for just getting off, for just dancing, for trying to be in Hollywood, trying to be in the industry. So for me, um, I graduated from an HBC. And so I was always inclined um, to of Johnson Smith University and Charlotte uh, Charlotte North Carolina. And so for me, I've always been inclined. Uh, my, my school was built by slaves. You know, so for me, I'm uh, always understanding that the research and the lives of my ancestors that have actually gave their lives and had their lives taken to get me to where I am today, um, I was compelled to Boom, I love Pearl. Okay, let's blend it. And so that in, in, in itself created my own lane. There's no traffic in my lane. So for me, um, I would say to find what it is that you love, that you really truly love to do, and that you can grow in, and um, pursue it relentlessly. Um, a lot of times, um, I'm kind of, I overthink a lot. So I just be like, oh man, should I do that? I don't know. And then I ask somebody who actually has no relevance or their mission might not even be my mission, but because they're thinking on a physical, like, oh, well, that's not going to be dope because people don't want to see that. You know what I mean? I stop asking those people. Mm -hmm. I stop asking them. Um, I would ask the universe for signs for the confirmation. Mm -hmm. And you ask the universe for confirmation. Universe will send you a confirmation. So I would get confirmation in like a butterfly or a ladybug or a bird or like rain. Like I'm telling you, it's real. It's so real. So for me, um, I, I came to a point where I, I was really constantly asking for confirmation and for the validation of it. Um, but see, I had to learn that my validation was from within mm -hmm. and it's in my DNA to be great. So for me, um, just being fearful but understanding that I'm built for greatness is actually giving me a different kind of confidence because I know what I'm here to do. And I know that there's nobody else doing it. And I know that nobody else can do it how I do it. But at the same time, me researching, me knowing that Nina Simone was fearless in her approach and what she had to say. And so were my other ancestors. Um, that also gave me more confidence to walk within um, my destiny and what I was meant to do. And then also um, collaborative efforts with other dope artists. Um, like for me, even just this panel is such a dope confirmation of art. You know, like I could work, I could get off and he could paint. You know what I mean? She could, we, I could be getting off to her mix, you know? So for me, um, you have to find like-minded individuals too that understand and that are tuned into the same frequency that you're in too. So that way, um, it won't be so just bearing on yourself, you know. But for me, it's just you have to really understand where you come from to go where you need to go. So a lot of saying over, um, a lot of understanding that um, you're meant for greatness and. Um, a lot of times the world tries to put you in this box and the world tries to tell you who you are and who you need to be. I don't look like your average dancer. I don't, I, I don't. I've been to auditions in the industry and it just didn't work out. But I knew it wasn't me, it was the industry, you know? So when I found my own leg, it was like, well, I can do whatever I want to do. But it can be really effective too. So for me, um, just research, and um, knowing pain for me, uh, knowing myself, knowing what I stand for as an individual, as a human being, my morals, my values, and then 
being fearless when it comes to merging that and being myself and presenting it to the world. Um, I think that's like my main thing that I would say to aspiring artists and political activists and everybody. Yeah. I'll keep it super. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. I know, I know what I'm going to close, but um, I want to echo DJ Nick's sentiments about self care. Just really quickly uh, self care is community care. A lot of times it seems like an individual thing, like, oh, I'm in my, you know, in my own, whatever. But, but taking care of yourself and making sure you're in a uh, healthy, mentally, emotional place is, is the, the foundation that assures that you can provide your best self and bring your highest self to the world. So self care is community care, and that's a revolutionary act in and of itself. So I wanted just I wanted to echo that sentiment. But as far as like advice that I would offer to artists or activists or however you identify, is number one, <clears throat> you have to do what you can within your sphere of influence because we're dealing with these seemingly insurmountable uh, social ills or problems or whatever. It's like how can I solve racism? It's like well, I don't know, but I know that I can do this today, and I know that I can impact this group of people here, and hopefully that that will you know somehow. Either I'll be able to leverage some other kind of um, uh, platform or something to, to, to raise awareness or to increase the awareness, but you gotta do what you can today within your sphere of influence. You gotta figure out what that is. I feel like the measure of success is taking uh, the next right step one step at a time, right? So, like, breaking it down in that way, knowing, like, okay, I am doing what I can within my sphere of influence. I identify what it is that I need to say. A part of the reason, or part of the thing that, um, that was such a, uh, a useful thing for me at the beginning of just starting to work on a video game. I was, I was saying something that I felt like I could no longer be silent. Like there was no way I could not address it, right? So at that point, I knew that this was something that had to be said and I had to remind myself. I had to speak and continue to do this even when my voice shakes, right? So like, mm -hmm. you're not gonna be this superhuman person all the time. You know, as artists, we are expected, but you gotta, you have to identify and understand what your limitations are as a human person and attend to those and take care of those things, but you still must do the work. So, um, so I think that's a huge thing. And then also leveraging like social media, I mean, if you get into it, get off on it like that, you know what I mean? It's a very powerful tool. It can be very toxic if it's not handled in the correct way, but figure out a way to use it, use it and utilize it properly. It's a, it's, I feel like the most effective piece of, you know, art, whatever you have in your arsenal to kind of make a global, national, whatever impact you're going to make. So, figuring out how to leverage that alongside your art streets. Well, I do want to respect people's time, and I appreciate you all for answering my questions. But if anyone in the audience has something they would like to ask for everyone here,
but also thinking about the classroom, making the classroom, and that, that division between those spaces is completely artificial and always has been in African American life. Right? Yes, that's so, true. I don't actually did, I'm sorry, because you know, I, I, I was a part of the hip hop stuff, right? It was at USC. And um, they were trying to understand the community versus academic, right? So um, a lot of times I feel like the academic, the world of academics and education, they feel like they're, they're more important than the community. And for me, it's just, it's like, uh, it's equal. You know, the things that I learned in the hood on Crenshaw Rodeo are just as valuable as me learning a Shakespeare uh, play or, or, you know, that type of research is just as important. And the thing is, um, that happens is uh, a lot of times, even with Crump, um, we have studio Crumpers who learn Crump in the studio, and then they get a totally different feel when they come to a session in the street. You know? So, um, both are, both are both, like, you know, they're both valid, but at the same time, um, I think, like you said, it's, it is a lot of false um, pedestals, in a sense, and it's just like, no, we're equal, you know, and um, in a way, specifically, too, um, even with this, like, I, I live on Crenshaw Road, down the street from Dorsey, okay, so um, uh, my mom lives on Swanson, and for me, I've seen this, I have a picture with this. Like the thing is, people don't understand. It hurts when it's like it hurt, especially when uh, you have one of the only hip hop artists that is actually invested in the hood, who been through the trenches, who gives back to the trenches, and who is still in the trenches. You know. So for me, um, to see what happened and to just even just experience it, when I first heard, I was like, whoa. Well, he's about to make a comeback. Oh, he's about to be a dope album. Oh, wow. You know, I don't know if you guys remember when the, uh, the Lakers were winning the three-peat and the morale of L.A. was unstoppable, right? So when this hit, it was like, this is deep. This is really deep. And then for me to see all these outsiders um, in the sense, I don't want to say glorify it or just you're not from the hood, you know what I mean? Like just because you feel like you know you connect to his music, it, it hit LA harder. So for me to see just random people out on Crenshaw and Slauson, you have to actually do the GPS to get to Crenshaw and Slauson. And this sense of gentrification too, it's real in LA. You know, they're trying to get rid of us. I saw every time I see um, people jogging, I was like, do you know that this gas station is not the gas station that you should be at? But that was years ago. You know what I mean? I've seen shotguns be pulled out of this gas station, but you're jogging right now. <laughs> you know? So um, this sense of uh, uh, special gentrification, and then in Crump too, it happens. There's a lot of politics in Crump too, to where you. Uh, what you start to see is less black, less black, less black on the TV. But in the trenches, that's what's real. And then what you see too is these non-black faces come to maybe a session or two, and then they go back, and then it's like, oh, all the praise is given to them, and all this power is given to them. And it's not fair to somebody like me who has to really get it through the mud every time. You know what I mean? But the same sense, it's not really taken, uh, it's not authentic, and you can kind of feel like that it's not authentic too, you know? But it's just a constant battle, and a constant like uphill, all right, we just gotta keep on going, keep on going, as hard as it may be. Yeah. I just wanted to say something really quickly. Uh, because I think this, that's a really poignant question that I've been kind of tracking through my process of uh, presenting the video game. Uh, I've, I've been in some really, really white spaces, traditionally white elitist spaces, museums, um, theaters, you know, like that, that have a kind of elitist kind of thing to it. And for me, what I do is I take unapologetically everything that my work is representing 
everything that the show is engaging with and how it's presented to disrupt these spaces. So that's another charge for like the aspiring artists or whatever, like make sure that like whatever you're doing is authentic to you and that you don't compromise that authenticity. You know, my show is like, there's music, music is a huge part of it, which is like, like listening to DJ Lynette speak and like the, the kind of scholarly portion of it is like, it's something intrinsic, intrinsically that I feel that I don't understand at an academic level in that way, but there's a science to it, you know what I mean? And like, so, but making sure that like, no, I'm not gonna, there is no, you know, um, censored version of the show, you know what I mean? Like I dropped the word bigger the first five minutes of the show, just so all white people know this is the kind of thing that you're about to be witnessing. You got a problem where you can leave, but this is my art and this is what I'm doing. You know, no, we can't take the music out of a couple of decimals because this is what the show is. So if it can't, if, if it's not right for your space, then we don't do it. You know, and so being on college, everybody, now it takes time to get to that. You know, when I first started doing the show, it was just like, I was having to be like, yeah. Like, after some point, you know, that confidence is like, this is what it is. This is what it is. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. You know, it's not about going on auditions in the industry and stuff. The problem is not you or me or the art. The problem is the institution. So yeah. it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, it just keep it moving, like, making sure that, like, a part of activism, political resistance takes on, takes on a lot of forms. It does look like protesting, marching around, but it also looks like standing your ground in terms of your art and not compromising that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. I'm so glad you asked that question for me. And yeah, we have had conversations about anti-blackness in California. Because, I mean, these are from LA, right? right? But, I, but I, so a couple of books come to mind. I'm actually not an academic, by the way, but when I say I'm a survivor, I mean my immediate family members were in prison. My immediate family you know, members were addicted to crap throughout the 80s. Like, I am a trickster who's sort of like a spook who sat by the door of the academy because I'm super critical of the academy and absolutely don't feel like I am fortunate to be in it, but in fact that they are lucky to have me because I know. <laughs> Off limits to us. What kind of false sense of access? 
But just, you know, just, just thinking about just having, the, and just, just think further about or more deeply about the history, the conservative history of California. Ronald Reagan was California governor first. He was an actor, right? So I think that, those, that, that, that history is really important and very much so an anti black What was the second book? Yeah. And 
and you really struggle because of the literally like the kind of spatial dynamic where it's like hard to get to each other. So it's also inherent in classes because also the public transportation system sucks. <laughs> like, and it's majority black and brown people on those public transportation systems, and a lot of times they're suffering. <laughs> right? And so there's also this whole history of like the number of countries not country, the other states that send homeless people to or houseless people to California because it is a warm state. Um, and what that means for folks who are trying to access a simple address. I mean, it's just deep. Like, I, I had to go to UCLA the other day, and it was like 8 a.m. in the morning, and I saw, like, all these mansions, and then all these, like, 1987, 94 pickup trucks parked in front of those mansions with brown people tending to the lawns. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, this place is inherently anti-black, and of course, anti black and anti-woman, and anti-trans, and it's on the books. Look at how people in prison are treated. Um, I mean, yeah, so I just, I just wanted to say that because I think that there, are, um, it's a very important conversation to have, to, to think about our quality of life here, um, and to think about who's not in the room right now. To think about who UCLA hires and doesn't, to think about who USC hires, to think about how black study programs are, are treated <laughs> in the academy. Right, I mean, that's just, yeah. That's just, uh, I agree too. That's something I mean. Uh, I do, I think that they don't like the term anti black so they kind of like code it in for me. You know, I went to Culver City High, so it was, it was mixed, you know, it was a mixed school. You know, so for me, I didn't feel like. I didn't feel black until I went to HBC. Mm -hmm. I knew I was black as my, you know, I lived in the hood and everything, but I think the sense of owning my blackness um, came from like really understanding my blackness. Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of times um, LA uh, doesn't make you embrace it, you know. If, if what LA as a side tries to do is, oh well, you gotta understand somebody else because they're just as important as you. You know what I mean? And then in turn, it kind of, it doesn't make you accept and embrace yourself and your people, you know? So I had to get to know all of my friends who were all of different races. It's great. You know, different ethnic groups is great. Cultural is awesome. But <laughs> <laughs> me, the, like, the uh, HBCU, uh, that really opened my eyes to just how powerful I am and the lineage and the history that's embedded in me, you know? And um, these institutions that kind of take away, or they don't really tell you, you know, how great you are, because they're worried about everybody else's, uh, their stigmas and stuff like that. So I think it's important because they don't make it seem like it's a kind of like, it's like, oh, we love everybody. But it's like, with us loving everybody, we're showing everybody this, Overall, it's still taking away, you know. So. Can we give these folks a round of applause?
and that will happen in the future. So for me, the intentionality of putting together events like this and supporting this is for everyone to start connecting with each other, maybe in ways that you had not thought before. So oops, take it away. And 
what we're working on right now is putting together kids because we oftentimes um, connect with folks who just got out, and so we're creating a kit for folks to take with them that, you know, a resource kit, and so that looks like a bus pass, you know, that looks like, you know, a gift card for food, that looks like uh, hygiene products, right? Mm -hmm. So if y'all want to start a drive, um, to help us Um, you know, a performer, whatever.